It is usually the case that the chair has existed longer than the chair holder has been on the faculty, <laughs> but in this case, the chair is of fairly recent vintage, 2001, uh, and the chair holder has been a member of this faculty for more than a half century, 55 years to be exact. The Warner Booker Distinguished Professorship in International Law was funded through a book by Donald W. Booker, the class of 1948 and it supports eminent scholars who teach and conduct leading research in the field. That's not the only piece that fits Dick Howard. Donald Booker was born in 1921 in Wilmington, Delaware. After graduating from Tower Hill School in Wilmington, he earned a bachelor's degree at Colgate University and then served in World War II as an officer on a US Navy destroyer. After the war, he earned his JD here at Virginia, was accepted into the Delaware Bar, and joined the Wilmington law firm of Morris, James, Hitchens, and Williams. He then opened up his own practice, which he maintained until his death in 2000. He was unfailingly loyal to his friends and revered as an advocate of justice and a champion of the rule of law. He considered the license uh, to practice law a privilege that must be guarded carefully, never letting business pressures overshadow the principles and responsibilities of the profession. That's the chair. Now on to the new chair holder, who, as you can already see, shares many of Mr. Booker's views about serving as a champion for the rule of law. I wanted to say one word about, not one word, a small story about uh, the first time I really uh, became aware of Dick Howard. So I met him when I came here to interview, uh, but before joining the faculty here, I clerked at the Supreme Court, and as perhaps many law clerks at the time did, I wandered down to the public exhibits to watch the movie introducing the justices of the court to the public. And who did I see there but my future colleague, Dick Howard, interviewing the justices on screen with his usual elegance, modesty, generosity, intelligence, and erudition. And though I had already met Dick, that will always be my first introduction <laughs> to him uh, in my head. The luminary UVA law professor chosen for all the right reasons to bring the justices to the public, make them human, and help explain what they do. As I've gotten to know Dick over the past 16 years, the traits on display in that film, traits to which we are generally as a community committed to here at UVA, have only become more apparent. It is not surprising that Dick should embody these UVA ideals. Born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, he is a graduate of the University of Richmond and received his law degree from the University of Virginia in 1961. He was a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford, where he read philosophy, politics, and economics. And after graduating from law school, he was a law clerk for two years to Justice Hugo Black of the Supreme Court of the United States, and also served as an associate at Covington and Burling. Dick has spent more than 50 years learning, writing, consulting on, and teaching about the Supreme Court of the United States, the Constitution of Virginia, Anglo-American constitutionalism and civic education, constitution making in other countries, and comparative constitutionalism. Much of that work has taken the form of traditional scholarship, and Dick is the author of numerous books, articles, and monographs, including The Road from Runnymede, Magna Carta Constitutionalism in America, Commentaries on the Constitution of Virginia, which won a Phi Beta Kappa Prize, Democracy's Dawn, and Constitution Making in Eastern Europe. Running through all of Dick's work, is a deep engagement with the idea of constitutions and constitutionalism at the state, national, and international levels, on paper and in practice, in scholarship in the world, and past, present, and future. Dick sees a direct link between Magna Carta and 21st century constitutions. He is interested in the quote, fundamental principles that flow from the uses later generations have made of Magna Carta, the rule of law, due process of law, constitutional supremacy, and the idea of an organic, evolving constitution adapted to changing times and circumstances. Most relevant to the international aspect of the Booker Warner Chair is the comparative nature of Dick's constitutional career. He says, quote, comparativism in constitutional law serves many purposes. It enriches one study of American constitutional law by adding another dimension to our critique of what the Supreme Court does. It heightens our sense of the world beyond our national boundaries, useful to lawyers whose firms and clients operate on the international scene, but also to lawyers as world citizens. Ultimately, comparative studies can also nourish our search for principles of ordered liberty and for theories of a just society. 
In other words, Dick's portfolio is grand and ambitious, the entire sweep of a constitutionalism that Dick sees as a dialogue, quote, about the nature and ends of government institutions, a debate over the effective means of living together under conditions of ordered liberty. Constitutionalism is a deeply intellectual pursuit for Dick, but it is far from academic. He is the consummate citizen scholar or citizen of the world. One of the many profiles written about him put it this way. Dick Howard, quote, has made a career of thinking about constitutions, how they work, and how they affect the day-to-day -day lives of the people who live under them. He has passed his ideas to others, teaching constitutional law to thousands of students at the University of Virginia. I don't think that's an, an overstatement. Uh, helping to draft Virginia's 1971 constitution and consulting in the drafting of more than a dozen constitutions worldwide. So by citizen, I mean that at every level, the Commonwealth, the nation, and the world. In the Commonwealth, Dick served as the executive director of the commission that wrote Virginia's current constitution and directed the successful referendum campaign for its ratification in 1971. The Washington Post described him as the chief architect, and he was chosen as draftsman by the 11 members of the Commission on the Constitutional Revision, whose members included then law school dean Hardy Cross Dillard, leading civil rights lawyer Oliver Hill and Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell Jr. It was quite a vote of confidence to choose Dick Howard, a young Dick Howard, as the draftsman. As counsel, uh, Dick also has served as counsel to the General Assembly of Virginia and a consultant to many other state entities. From 1982 to 1986, he served as counselor to the governor of Virginia and he chaired Virginia's commission on the bicentennial of the United States Constitution. As recently as 2016, Governor Governor Terry McAuliffe, in announcing the restoration of voting rights to convicted felons, recognized Dick for his consultation on the matter as, quote, the foremost constitutional authority in Virginia. In terms of federal service, Dick worked for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, and he has consulted federally on state constitutions across the U.S. On an international level, consulting new or revised constitutions uh, has taken him to places as far flung and, met and introduced him to people as far flung as Brazil, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, Russia, Albania, Malawi, and South Africa. Dick has not only written constitutions and advised on them, but he has also interpreted and helped courts interpret and apply them. He has briefed and argued cases before state and federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court. He has also served in the fourth estate, in the media, helping the public understand the law and constitution better. He has been a regular guest on television news programs, and during the Senate Judiciary Committee's hearings on the nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court, he provided coverage for the McNeil Lehrer News Hour. He regularly convenes Supreme Court reviews uh, for the Fourth Circuit Judicial Conference, as well as for our lucky students and faculty here. And of course, there's the movie at the Supreme Court. <clears throat> Dick has received too many awards to mention here, but I will mention the highlights. In 1996, the Union of Czech Lawyers, citing Dick's promotion of the idea of a civil society in Central Europe, awarded him their Randa Medal, which was the first time the honor had been conferred upon anyone other than a Czech citizen. In the fall of 2001, Dick was uh, the first distinguished visiting scholar in residence at Rhodes House, Oxford. He has been uh, conferred the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws by James Madison University, the University of Richmond, Campbell University, the College of William and Mary, and Wake Forest University. He has received awards for being among the most respected educators in the nation, among the greatest Virginians of the 20th century, and among the best teachers at UVA for his deep dedication to teaching and mentoring students. In 2013, the Virginia Holocaust Museum and the Virginia Law Foundation bestowed upon him their Legacy of Nuremberg Award, citing Howard's, citing his, sorry, contribution, quote, contribution to global standards for the rule of law and the prevention of crimes against humanity in the shaping and drafting of constitutions in many lands. That same year, Dick received the University of Virginia Thomas Jefferson Award, which is the highest honor given to faculty members at the university. President Sullivan said, quote, in the sweep and compass of his writings on constitutional law, Mr. Howard is a scholar without peer. He is also a tireless teacher and mentor, having achieved legendary status among law alumni and current students for his keen powers of explanation, his devotion to his students, both personally and professionally, 
and his inexhaustible patience. In other words, Dick is and has long been a giant among us. It is an honor to celebrate him and to continue to learn from him today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Well. That was a breathtaking introduction. I, I hated to hear her quit. I was just going to let her carry on. and <laughs> I wouldn't have to say anything. Well, thank you, Risa, so much. That was an elegant and gracious introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming today and spending a few with, minutes with, with me. Um, I want to hit, tell three stories. Uh, one of them is about Ruddy Mead, one is about Richmond, and one is about Budapest. And I hope that will sort of draw you into my world of constitutions and constitutionalism. Um, first story is at Runnymede. Uh, it's really a story about me and King John. Well, well, actually, I didn't actually meet King John, so I've been around for a while, but not quite that long. Um, I was introduced to King John through A.A. A. Milne. You Winnie the Pooh fans will recognize A.A. A. Milne, I think. And he, did a one, he wrote a wonderful little book called Now We Are Six, and in it there's a poem called King John's Christmas. And the poem starts out something like, um, King John was not a good man. He had his many ways. And sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. Well, when, I'm, when you're a kid and you read that poem and you think, gosh, to be disliked that, nobody could be that bad. Well, I grew up and read a little more about King John, and he was that bad, in fact. So <laughs> um, years later, um, when I started on my academic career, I decided I would write a, a, a short monograph on Magna Carta's influence on American constitutionalism. Um, it grew into a book, The Road from Runnymede. I discovered it was somewhat untilled ground. And that book seems to have had a long shelf life, because in 2015, at the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, I was asked to, to moderate the opening or the closing plenary session at the American Bar Association's meeting in London. Uh, well, my friends in England got word that I was coming over and they started extending lecture invitations. And so by the time I was over there, I wound up giving something like nine lectures in three weeks, which was already except it wasn't the same lecture each time. It really did a lot of work. Um, the most interesting invitation came from BBC. And they asked me if I would do an interview with them. And it was on a day I had another lecture to give. And I said, I'm really kind of busy that day. And they said, well, you might like to know that uh, 40 million people will hear this lecture. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe I can make, I've never had, a, <laughs> I've never had an audience of 40 million people. Uh, I think I can do, now I don't know if, for, if anybody listened. I had their word for it, right? But, <laughs> but I, I did the interview. So that, that was great fun. That was in 2015. Now, Magna Carta in its own time, uh, it's a historical document, mostly concerned with feudal relationships and things of, of really no interest to a modern audience. It's a document that never should have survived because King John never meant to keep his promises. He was forced into this bargain with the barons at Runnymede, and so he, he was going to overturn that thing. But then he died the next year, and his successor, Henry III, was nine years old. And you're a nine-year-old king, you know, <laughs> you may not live to your maturity. So his advisor said, look, for a public relations gimmick, we will have Henry III reissue Magna Carta. And he did, and that began the tradition down through the years of reissues of all, certainly all the 13th century kings reissuing Magna Carta. Well, Magna Carta is not important to us for what it meant in the 13th century. Its importance lies in what later generations made of it, what they took it to mean, what, what they thought they could accomplish with it. For example, in the 17th century, when the Stuarts came to the throne of England, 1603, they brought with them the philosophy of the divine right of kings. Well, divine right of kings is not exactly a constitutional principle. So he was on a collision course with Parliament, whose leader, Sir Edward Cook, a Lord Cook, was not only in Parliament, but the great commentator of his era on Magna Carta. And he said, sovereign power is no parliamentary word. Magna Carta is such a fellow he will have no sovereign. 
Well, that planted the seed in the 17th century that Magna Carta became an iconic way of resisting arbitrary power. On the American side of the ocean, Magna Carta came to this country with the Virginia Company Charter of 1606, which provided that those who emigrated to Virginia would bring with them the privileges, franchises, and immunities of English citizens, which is to say that when they pulled up road in England, came to America, they didn't leave their rights behind, they brought them with them. Well, that same provision was found in all the other early colonial charters, and it really survived to be, it was passed down from one generation to the next, so that in the revolutionary period, once again it was put into play to resist arbitrary power. Fame, I have a friend here visiting from Boston. Uh, in Boston, 1761, there was the famous uh, case argued by uh, James Otis, the so-called writs of assistance case, writs of assistance being limitless general search warrants. And in that case, Otis revived Lord Cook's writings and his cases and argued that there were acts, even acts of parliament, that were subject to constitutional limitations. That, uh, and Magna Carta stood for that proposition. Well, that idea then flourished during the revolutionary period in the Continental Congress, for example, of 1774. The um, Magna Carta was one of the central features that was invaded by the um, members of that Congress against British, uh, against British power. So by the time of revolution, by 1776, Magna Carta had worked its way into the fabric the corpus of American constitutional law. So from my first story, what, what lessons do I draw telling that very brief uh, story of Magna Carta? First, that Magna Carta has become <laughs> around the world, far beyond the country of its birth, an icon of the rule of law. That when people want to summon up some, some symbol of rule of law, they typically summon up Magna Carta. Secondly, it's where we get the notion of due process of law. The due process of law that we Americans know about has its roots in the law of the language, land, uh, language of law, the land language of Magna Carta. Thirdly, I think Magna Carta has become the founding myth of Anglo-American constitutionalism. You know, countries have their founding myths. Uh, Rome had Romulus and Remus, and the uh, Jewish, the Israel, Israelis have uh, the exodus from Egypt and so forth. And I think in a very real way, when people are trying to see, say, what is the, really the roots of American constitutionalism, they tend to think of Magna Carta. Fourthly, Magna Carta, in a very interesting way, put us on the road to constitutional supremacy. Obviously, it was not a constitution in the modern sense in its own day, but Lord Cook began to think of it that way. James Otis made that argument in Boston. We're clearly on the road from the 13th century to the supremacy clause of the federal constitution. Th think about Marbury versus Madison, where uh, John Marshall talks in his opinion about the, the what does he call them, the general principles of jurisprudence. And then finally says, oh yes, and by the way, there's the language of the supremacy clause. But he's thinking in terms of constitutional supremacy again rooted ultimately in Magna Carta. And then finally, I think Magna Carta is one way of thinking about the tradition of, of organic constitutional development. It's really hard to understand and appreciate American constitutional law without thinking about the common law. I mean, that's not all there is to it, but the American system has taken on that feel, that, that nature of organic development. And I um, was intrigued when I some years ago read Justice Kennedy's opinion in Lawrence versus Texas. That's the anti-sodomy law that was struck down by the Supreme Court. Kennedy, who by the way is a great fan of Magna Carta, talks about it a lot. He said, those who drew and ratified the due process clause did not presume to know the components of liberty and its manifold possibilities. The times can blind us to certain truths and, so, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. Uh, now there's the great debate, which I can't get into in time, doesn't permit today, the debate between originalism and the living Constitution. But if one in, engages in that debate, it's hard not to sort of 
take account of and decide what the meaning is of this common law principle. Well, that's my first story. Second story, we segue from England's Runnymede to Virginia's Richmond. And this is a story that begins when I was a very raw new member of the law faculty, um, and Governor Godwin appointed the Commission on Constitutional Revision that uh, Risa talked about. A remarkable commission, two former governors, including Colgate Darden, former president of the University of Virginia, um, Lewis Powell, who later, later sat on the U.S. Supreme Court, um, Hardy Dillard, the dean, who then later sat on the World Court at The Hague, Oliver Hill, who was the leading civil rights attorney in Virginia at that time. I mean, simply remarkable group of people. Well, they needed an executive director, a draftsman, who would sort of put their decisions into language, and they approached me, and I was, you know, young law professor full of, you know, get up and go, and I said, no problem, I, you want to write a constitution? I can, I can do that. <laughs> you know, I thought it was like writing, what, a will or a deed? You go to the form book, right? We the people of, and fill in the blank, and then go, <laughs> go from there. Well, I mean, what did I know? The fact was, I did, didn't have the gall to tell them I had never read the existing Virginia Constitution. I don't recall, frankly, in my three years in law school, I don't recall any of my professors ever talking about state constitutions. Now, maybe they did, and I was absent that day, or dozing, or whatever, but I don't recall that they did. So, of course, I went and read the Virginia Constitution. The 1902 Constitution, long and, and heavy, a populist document and a racist document. It was the Constitution that gave us the poll tax, uh, mandated segregated schools, and disenfranchised pra practically every African American in in Virginia, I mean, it was an effective machine to get the black vote out of, out of politics. There was a, a moment at the um, 1902 convention, Carter Glass, later architect of the Federal Reserve System, was the uh, floor, floor manager of the franchise provisions of the, what became the 1902 Constitution. And one of the, he explained what it was to do, and one of the other delegates said, well, Mr. Glass, uh, <laughs> won't this Constitution discriminate? And Glass said, discriminate? What do you think we're here for? <laughs> so, I mean, now, today we would dress it up in pretty language, but then they were very upfront about their, and, and it, it worked. It did exactly what they set out to do. Well, then I read some other state constitutions. Again, I was new to this world of what the states were doing, so I read, for example, Louisiana's constitution, which had the provision that um, Huey P. Long's birthday shall forever be a state holiday in Louisiana. <laughs> I mean, really. Oklahoma's constitution that defined the flashpoint of kerosene. I mean, what? It's in the constitution. Maybe they didn't trust the legislature to get it right. Well, so in Virginia, we set about junking this 1902 constitution and writing a modern constitution. The commission worked for about six months. They presented their uh, findings, their proposed constitution to the General Assembly, which then made further revisions to it. And then it went to uh, the ballot referendum. Well, I, you know, I thought I was <laughs> going to be on the sidelines at that point, but Governor Linwood Holton, the first Republican governor in modern Virginia, approached me and said, would you run a constitutional campaign? Holly Moore, who worked with, with me in that campaign, is here. And once again, I said, hey, no problem. I helped you write it. I can certainly help you sell it. So I set out. I didn't know anything about politics. I'd never worked in a campaign. So I said, I'll have to set out to do whatever I would do if I were managing a campaign for governor or senator, statewide campaign. So we had speakers and bumper stickers and all the paraphernalia, television advertising, everything else. I took leave of absence from the law school and went all over the state making talks black churches, union halls, women's clubs, civic clubs, you name it. Uh, I saw parts of Virginia I would never have dreamed of seeing but for that campaign. Um, it was my first encounter with conspiracy theories. Uh, I was giving a talk at the Rotary Club in Colonial Heights, Virginia, just south of Richmond, and there was a man sitting in the front row with a very dour look on his, you could tell he didn't buy anything I was having to say. He was sitting there, you know, recording my talk, which I knew was no compliment. 
And then in the Q&A session, he had brought with him some kind of device that was a logo. And it was the logo of the United Nations, if you know what that looks like. But the parts were movable, so that with a couple of changes of the hand, the UN logo became the, the hammer and sickle of the Soviet Union. <laughs> well, I wondered, what did this have to do with the Virginia Constitution? But of course, the, the message he was signaling was uh, this proposed Constitution could not have been written in Virginia. It has to be a foreign import. It came from Moscow or Beijing or, or worse yet, maybe from Chicago or New York. <laughs> so. <laughs> And, and I couldn't believe it, but of course that's what conspiracy theories are, are about. Well, we, 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 want, we sold the Constitution. 72% of the voters said yes, which is a landslide in politics. I, actually, that's almost as many votes as Mr. Putin got the other day, 76% <laughs> in Russia. So we, we did pretty well in, in Virginia. So that's the, that was the campaign. What did we achieve? Well, first, to just to give you a few examples, education is now in the Virginia Bill of Rights, actually drawing on the language of Thomas Jefferson's bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge. Uh, a mandate to localities that there will be no closed schools in Virginia. We took care of the Prince Edward County. You may remember Prince Edward having closed its schools to avoid Brown versus Board. Uh, an environmental article, the first one that Virginia had ever had. We have an article an environmental piece in the Constitution, uh, and an anti-discrimination section, which actually which places gender on the same level as race. This is when ERA was being debated, and Virginia had its little ERA. And a very modern note, uh, a provision against uh, partisan gerrymandering, a provision that says that uh, in Virginia, legislative districts shall be compact and contiguous. And there's a case pending in the Supreme Court of Virginia right now, and um, I have to hold my breath. I hope they will take the language seriously, because I know what the framers intended. Uh, we shall <laughs> <laughs> I know what we intended. We shall find out. I mean, this is one more reminder, as we all of us lawyers know, that courts do have the final word on these things. They will decide what compact and contiguous means. And I would love to riff a little bit on courts and constitutions, but that has to be another lecture for another day. So that's my second story. My third story is even more contemporary. It turns out a couple of years ago I wouldn't have predicted this. My third story is the one that takes place in Budapest in Hungary. Uh, 1989, the collapse of communism after all those years of Cold War, the Berlin Wall came down, and suddenly, in a matter of weeks and months, uh, we had democratic regimes installed in these <coughs> former communist countries. Well, how did I get involved in all of this? So, you know, I'm not a student of Central and Eastern European history. I had, I had traveled there during the, when I was at Oxford and, and spent some, I actually spent a summer behind the behind the, um, the Soviet wall, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, but I, I didn't pretend to have expertise in that area. Well, the State Department, for some reason, asked me if I would uh, entertain, be host to a Hungarian delegation in Charlottesville. They came down for two days, and I did seminars on, well, what do you do when you write a constitution? So I then got invited to Budapest. This is 1988. This is a year before the wall came down, and, but I was there. I could, you could feel change in the air. You knew things that were about to happen. And then I had invitations, Risa pointed out, to a number of other uh, communist, then communist, about to be post-communist countries, and other parts of the world as well. Uh, I mean, for example, Albania. I'm not sure I could have found Albania on a map. All I knew about Albania was that in Mozart's Cosi Fontuti, the two lovers go off and they come back dressed as Albanians. <laughs> On the theory that nobody knows what an Albanian looks like. <laughs> I guess so. And that, so that was pretty amazing. And what I discovered in, in working with those countries was how much history and culture matter in the writing of constitutions. Um, a wag once said that Central and Eastern Europe carries more history in its knapsack than it can consume locally. We I mean, think about it, think about Sarajevo and that sort of thing, that so many things have happened because of 
the history and culture of Central and Eastern Europe. So when I was in Budapest, some students took me to the spot on the steps of the National Library. It's a very imposing building. And they wanted me to stand in the very spot where Hungary's great national poet, Sandro Petofi, had stood when he declaimed his famous national hymn. The Hungarians all know this. It's sort of like our knowing our national anthem. I was out to dinner one evening with Hungarian friends. And we were talking about the revolutions of 1848. And I said, you know, there was a cafe pillbox where Sandor Petofi and the other uh, liberals and reformers of 1848 used to meet and talk about what they hoped would happen. They were still under Austrian rule. And I said, I'm sort of curious, does that cafe still, still exist? Maybe it's not a cafe anymore, but I'd sort of like to, to see it if it's still there. Well, after I said that, one of the women sitting at the table uh, turned to her friends, pointing to me, said, there, I told you he was Hungarian. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, mean, I don't have any Hungarian blood that I know about, but clearly to her, she, she said, only someone who is Hungarian would care that much about what happened in Budapest in 1848. So these people live and breathe Hungary in a way that is perhaps hard to appreciate in this country. Well, these new constitutions were, were good ones. Obviously, I was only a marginal player in a much bigger story. I was really giving advice, heeded or not. But the new constitutions, by and large, looked to Western principles of liberal constitutional democracy. Um, free and fair elections, free press, independent courts, checks and balances, constitutional supremacy, all the things you'd want to find in a, in a good constitution. International norms, they would look to the Universal Declaration of Rights, they looked to the European Convention on Human Rights, and they looked to Western constitutions, in particular uh, Germany's Basic Law of 1949, documents like that. So they were a distillation in many ways of the best principles of Western constitutionalism. And there was optimism, I remember that time, we felt like it was another springtime of nations, that it was, that change and reform and progress were in the air. Uh, some of you will know uh, Francis Fukuyama's famous book, The uh, End of History and the Last Man. And Fukuyama predicted that the, the destiny of global world com constitutionalism was liberal democracy, that that would be almost in a Hegelian sense, the ultimate form of human government. Well, that was the 1990s. And nobody talks that way now. I mean, that seems a long time ago. The widely shared optimism about the spread of liberal constitutional democracy has been under undermined in our time by nationalism, by populism, by xenophobia, by anti-globalism uh, in many places. Uh, China, we read about uh, events there, uh, Russia, uh, Brexit in the United Kingdom, the rise of far-right parties in Europe. There's a lot of this in the air. And in particular, it's taking place in Hungary and Poland, two places where I spent a fair amount of time in the uh, period of change. Um, in 1989, I met a young student. I don't think he was in his mid He was about the median age of law students here at the University of Virginia, a man named Viktor Orban. Uh, and he spoke at the ceremonial reburial of Imre Naj and the other leaders of the abortive uprising in Hungary in 1956. They had been executed by the communists and they were now being reburied with, with great ceremony. And Orban was called upon as a student to speak, be one of the speakers. He electrified, there, were, there must have been 250,000 people gathered, plus millions of people watching on television. And Orban electrified the crowd by calling for free elections and for the Soviets to get out, for them to withdraw. Well, uh, within a few months, communism had been swept away and Hungary was a free country. That was 1989. Uh, in 2018, things are very different. Viktor Orban, then a student, is now the prime minister of Hungary. And he says that the era of liberalism in Europe is now at an end, it's over. And he proclaims Hungary to be, as he puts it, an illiberal democracy. Not a liberal democracy, but an illiberal democracy. 
He sees himself as being a buffer against EU bureaucrats, against, uh, he picks out George Soros in particular as, a, as an enemy, and against uh, Muslim invasions and, and, and migrants in general. Uh, this journey of Viktor Orban is certainly one of the most remarkable transformations uh, in modern European politics. And it's also a story in a larger sense of how the historic transition to democracy in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which seemed even a decade ago irreversible after 10 different former communist countries became EU members, um, that now it's beginning to unravel, uh, posing, certainly posing threats to EU values, and some people wonder whether it's a threat to the future of the EU itself. In 2010, eight years ago, Viktor Orban's party, Fidesz, won uh, an election. They had a bare majority of the seats of the votes, but in under Hungary's electoral system, it gave them a two-thirds majority in parliament. And in the Hungarian system with the two-thirds vote, you can amend Hungary's constitution, and they have done just that. Uh, they have been progressively dismantling the constraints of liberal democracy uh, ever since 2010. Uh, the attacks on the media, undermining checks and balances, taking control of the constitutional court, um, nurturing a system of crony capitalism where their friends are getting very rich, and gerrymandering, something we Americans know something about. It's no stranger to Hungary. And Orban portrays himself as defending Hungary against the EU and against Muslim hordes. One thing you have to understand about history in a place like Hungary is how people can think of themselves as victims, as being imposed upon by other people, uh, it, occupied by foreign powers for hundreds of years, surviving all that. They remember, for example, the Treaty of Trianon after World War I when Hungary was on the losing side in that, in that contest, and two-thirds of their territory was taken away from them, including a lot of ethnic Hungarians, and they've never forgotten that. They still remember, feel like they were unjustly dealt with, and it's interesting that Orban has actually conferred Hungarian citizenship on all the ethnic Hungarians who live in neighboring countries like Romania so they can vote in Hungarian elections and you can bet they will vote for Fidesz, for Orban's party. That's the Hungarian story. Uh, Poland, I'll be brief about, but Poland is not as quite as far down the path, but it's headed in the direction of illiberal democracy as well. And, and this one is more is especially striking because I have, have talked about Poland as a success story, as one of the countries that's really doing a good job. And they are, geopolitically much more significant than Hungary because they're so much bigger. I think there's 60 million Poles. They have a vibrant economy. They, they really matter on the European scene. They have something called the Law and Justice Party, which uh, denounces mainstream Hungarian politicians <laughs> as really being more comfortable with the cosmopolitan liberal elite in places like Brussels. I mean, we talk about, I talked about Chicago and New York, they talk about Brussels. And that they are simply not in tune with traditional Christian uh, Polish values. Well, they got a parliamentary majority in uh, 2015. And as I say, I think that's setting them on the illiberal democracy road. The constitutional court there is, is packed with law and justice appointees. The media has been attacked and undermined. Uh, checks and balances are being dismantled. Uh, they're attacking uh, NGOs, uh, restricting their activities, and again, fiddling with the electoral system. There's, there's a story really here of culture and identity. It's Poland thriving on conservative values, appeals to, to Catholicism, protecting families against uh, a godless Western Europe, free thinking, gender bending, and all of the rest. Um, there's a Polish national mythology that's not unlike the feeling of victimization in Hungary. And there's a recurrent theme in, in Polish uh, discourse of Poland being the Christ of nations, 
that somehow Poland has sacrificed itself for Western Europe and has never been appreciated for it. Um, there's a sense of fragility of nationhood in, these, in this part of the world that's really, uh, I think, very important. Take Poland as an example. Uh, they were gobbled up by the great powers in the 1790s. The third and final partition in 1795 wiped Poland off the face of Europe. And it did not appear on the map of Europe again until 1918. And yet the idea of Poland survived all that time. So the Poles look at the idea of the Polish nation as not something you can take for granted, but which has to be constantly defended. Of course, they were also the victims of not first Nazi invasions and then the Soviets. So they've really been buffeted about over the years. Um, they have therefore, the Law and Justice Department, uh, the uh, party, have taken it upon themselves to reshape history. I can't overemphasize how much history matters to these, these folks in Central and Eastern Europe. And you have, for example, you've been reading lately about the controversy over Poland's Holocaust law, which uh, makes it a crime for, for anyone to suggest Polish complicity in a Nazi atrocities. And of course, there's been a great debate both in Poland and beyond in that. Now, so I've told you the Hungarian and Polish stories. I think they reflect larger trends that are happening around the world. Not in every country, obviously, not in every place, but you're beginning to see it um, outside of any one part of the globe. Um, starting with nationalism, the idea of the nation uh, is something which it has in many ways its root in romantic nationalism, the Germans of the early 19th century. Um, some scholars have talked about the idea of imagined communities where people think of, well, Italy or Germany or whatever it may be, and then inculcate in Italians and Germans the idea of nationhood. And nationalist anger can be easily fueled, the, the feeling that you want to control your country's life. You don't want other people to impinge on that. The feeling that other people don't give you respect. You're not being appreciated by the rest of the world. And so nationalists are inclined to recall a glorious past. It may be myth mythological, uh, mythological, but they imagine this time that was better than today. They rail against the evils of the present time. And they, of course, promise a, a better future. Uh, American politics is not without this kind of instinct. As you know, we have a, an angry president who sees America being taken advantage of by other countries, China, for example, and vows to make America great again. So nationalism. Secondly, populism, which is very closely allied. I think it's the handmaiden of nationalism. Um, populists like to hang labels like enemies of the people. I remember during the Brexit debate, the, the tabloid press in, in England would talk about how the opponents of, of Brexit were enemies of the people. Uh, so populist politicians paint pictures of corrupt elites, in particular the elites, the immigrants who are taking over, the fake news, uh, the sinister conspiracies like the fella in the audience in Colonial Heights back during the Virginia uh, referendum. And of course, it's, it's allied with protectionism, keeping out foreign goods, keeping out immigrants, and keeping out foreign ideas. So nationalism, populism, and then thirdly, authoritarianism. It's interesting, we're not coming full circle back to communism or fascism or those things. It's a, it takes on a somewhat different form. It has, in many ways, the facade of democracy. That's why the phrase illiberal democracy is so interesting, that democracy doesn't fall out of the picture, but it's being recalculated for a new purpose. Some of the earmarks of authoritarianism are first majoritarianism, which is to say doing away with checks and balances, taking yourself as having a mandate after an election, taking over the economy by state or oligarchical control, similarly taking over the media, state media, or controlling the private media, uh, suppressing NGOs, uh, especially those that are advocating human rights or political reform. Um, using the raw, they have, they have a rule of law, but it's a different one from the ones that we talk about. Um, it reminds me of a time I was sitting and uh, working with some lawyers and judges in what was then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, 
and I don't speak any Russian, so I was working through a translator, I discovered that the translator was rendering the English language phrase rule of law as socialist legality. <laughs> well, I had to say, no, that's not exactly what we mean <laughs> when we talk about the rule of law. Uh, de democracy, as I said, is being redefined, and history is being revised. That con the control of history matters to authoritarian regimes, and Russia, the rehabilitation of Stalin, for example. I mean, can you imagine nostalgia about Stalin? Poland, I mentioned the Holocaust laws and so forth. And finally, emphasizing sovereignty, rejecting international criticism. That, For example, if you're in Eastern Europe, what the people in Western Europe have to say simply is not to be tolerated and is to be rejected. So authoritarianism is rearing its head. Of course, the two major authoritarian powers are China and Russia, uh, each taking uh, more uh, unpleasant forms all the time. So, so here's what we've got. I mean, think back to the post-World War II spread of democracy. Japan and Germany right after the war, both have turned into very, I think, very significant real democratic regimes. In the 1970s, in the Mediterranean, dictatorships, Greece and Portugal and Spain became democratic. The 1980s in Latin America, in particular Chile and Argentina, and then of course in the 1990s, the post-communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe. So liberal constitutional democracy wasn't flourishing everywhere by any means, but it was definitely on the end. more and more countries were joining the family of democratic nations. Well, the last decade has seen a disturbing pattern. Uh, Freedom House, for example, has, has count, counted more places in which trends have been reversed than where they've been favorable. So there's a, um, a decade of democracy under siege, if you like. Um, we have repressive countries, China, Russia, becoming more repressive. We have some democratic states becoming illiberal democracies, that's Hungary and Poland. Um, so, I've told you three stories. Uh, I think each of those three stories has its own analog, its own conclusion, but how would I sort of put it all together? I mean, what's my takeaway from these three stories? Well, here, here's, here are the ones that I have in mind first. Uh, there are surely, and this is a leap of faith if you like, there are some fundamental principles that define liberal constitutional democracy, and some of those principles flow, I would argue, back to Magna Carta. Secondly, I would say that constitutional principles travel across time, and they are reinterpreted by successive generations. They don't stand still. They, they take on meaning that earlier generations might not have imagined that they could. Thirdly, and this to me is an important part of the story I've tried to tell this today, that constitutions are ultimately contextual. Yes, you want to lay down general principles, you have to do that, but you have to take into account history, culture, tradition, mores, attitudes, how people think, how, how people behave, um, and that those national characteristics will ultimately define how a constitutional system works. And then finally, it seems to me that the sort of uh, instructive side of this story is that um, what we like to call liberalism or constitutionalism or democracy um, is not inevitable. It's a very <laughs> short slice of human history when you think about it. It's not bound to survive. Um, it seems to me the ideas that we associate with constitutional democracy have to be constantly defended and fought for and, and supported. And that the grounds for it, we can't simply do it automatically. We have to think about what it is we're, we're interpreting and, and articulating. Um, may I bring it all back to a, what a Virginian said? Forgive me for being parochial, but you know, I was born and raised in Virginia. It's in your genes to think that Virginians somehow ultimately know how to do it. Um, you, you, privately, I, you can take me aside and say, but there are few exceptions to that, Professor. <laughs> a few times that Virginia didn't get it right, and a few times it still doesn't get it right. Okay, I understand that. But I, I was looking for some, somebody to sum up what I'm trying to say here. 
And I can't find anything better than what George Mason said in the Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776. Uh, that language is still in the Virginia Constitution. You can bet that in revising the Constitution, we didn't mess with the Virginia Declaration of Rights. But here's what he had to say, that no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. A frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Seems to me that's a nice takeaway, and it's what I would leave with you in telling my three stories today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, sure, we've got time. Thank you. This is the time for you first year students to plant the question that'll blow your professor away when, <laughs> when you take the final exam. But do you have any questions or thoughts? Yes, Will. Um, so how long do you believe a constitution should go before eventually facing a substantial revision? I know uh, wow. Thomas Jefferson believed once a generation That's right. our federal constitution has only been amended this, this is a student who comes from North Carolina, which, as you may know, rejected the federal constitution the first time around, had a few faults to find, and then finally ratified. But that's a wonderful question. When I went around stumping the state for the proposed Virginia constitution, you can imagine I was quoting Thomas Jefferson, wrapping myself in the mantle of Thomas Jefferson, because, you know, well, he founded the university. It's uh, actually recent knows that it's written into my contract that I'm not permitted to go around and make talks without citing Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> but, but so I would cite, Jefferson wrote a famous letter in 1816 where he said, basically, each generation should rewrite the Constitution. And based on mortality tables of that age, he reckoned a generation to be 19 years. We live a lot longer, so call it 30 years or whatever you like. Well, at the time I was selling the new Virginia Constitution, it had been 60 years, right? So I could say it's really overdue on Thomas Jefferson's timetable. Now some time has passed. Uh, I suspect I'm becoming less generational, less Jeffersonian. I, I confess to a certain hypocrisy here because can you imagine if Virginia had a constitutional convention now what it would look like? It'd be madness. Every crazy single interest group in town would want to be there, and if their provision wasn't in the Constitution, they would say, we, we're not going to have it. I mean, I don't want to be... <laughs> so I, I guess I'm prepared to say maybe we ought to linger with an older Constitution longer than I would have said at one time. So, so your, your professor's a hypocrite, I guess, basically. <laughs> but, but that's a wonderful question. It may be that formal revisions mean less than they used to because there's so many ways that you change constitutions organically, what courts say, how people actually behave, what legislatures do. I mean, there's so many ways that constitutional law is made outside of the formal revision or replacement process. I, we're not seeing many states revise constitutions anymore. And I think it will become less and less likely that we will. So maybe this is one of those cases where practice and history overpower theory. But thank you for a very good question. Do have time for any other questions that you may want to put? That's, I thought that was a wonderful one. Yes, Max. You spoke about some uh, majoritarian undermining of checks and balances, uh, particularly in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, I was wondering if you saw any analog to after the latest presidential election, you had a big push on the left to get rid of the Electoral College yeah. um, and kind of how you see those kind of that's so interesting. The checks and balances, I wasn't specific about them, but the ones that are being undermined in places like Poland and Hungary are things like uh, agencies which are independent or somewhat autonomous in managing the economy or laying down press laws or things like it, so that you take it out of the direct political, democratic, legislative process and the like. And uh, the sort of things that have been set up sometimes in, in the American system. And in Poland and Hungary, those agencies are being co-opted and basically put in the hands of 
party loyalists. Your question is interesting because it's, it raises the question of checks and balances that are not simply these agencies, but built into the constitutional scheme itself. And as you know, the Federalist James Madison and the others at Philadelphia in 1787 were struggling really with two competing ideas. We've never really resolved this completely. And one of those ideas is we want accountable democratic government, we the people, right? So that's one, that's one principle which we really care about and articulate. And the competing principle is, but you don't want majorities to do anything they like. So that's where constitutionalism comes into play, right? To sort of limit majorities and tell them there's certain things you cannot do. Uh, those things are always in tension. And uh, you know, we've never perfectly worked that, that out. Well, the Madisonian, dis or the 1787 design included the Electoral College. And uh, a lot of people just love to be, be done with it. There are, I think, cogent and principled arguments on both sides of that. But it has produced some weird presidential results, more than one presidential contest where he who got the Electoral College did not get the majority vote. So that, that sort of is part of the impetus. But I guess even if you got rid of the Electoral College, one should think about should we retain some constitutional checks and balances of a kind which impede majoritarianism? That's really part of that tension that I've just been trying to describe. But thank you, Max. Good question. Yes. Last question. Do, do we have time for? Last question. Yeah. Last question. So I was curious to ask for the last story of the populace if there was anything you thought that. So obviously the breakdown of tax balance does seem wrong. But if you think that some of the criticism of the Western order, there is some merit to it. I mean, there's the populace that doesn't necessarily have to be anti democratic. I believe Dennis Bryan is one of the most famous Americans. So you would, would you speak up for some of the forces at work? in places like Eastern Europe? No, I was wondering if you think like maybe any element of their criticism. Ah, the okay, that's very interesting. This comes from a student with some uh, background who, kn who knows the Orthodox world. I, I guess the countries I mentioned were Protestant or Catholic, <clears throat> but as you move further east into Bulgaria, Romania, places like that, you of course have the Orthodox Church. And I think you have to, you know, I sort of went into all this consulting with other countries with, frankly, a bit of an academic view about that which is an ideal system. And I still think those principles matter. But one of the stories I tried to tell here today was the further you go into it, the more you realize that not only do you have to make these adjustments just to get the thing done, that's part of the inevitable compromise, but there's some serious arguments being made by people who want to make a place <clears throat> for their traditions and their history and their culture, their religion and, and the like. These are the things that make nations what they are. Uh, think about my last comment, and we want to quit. And it, we're all taken with enlightenment ideas, 18th century notions of human rights and the like. One tends to forget that the idea of the nation also comes from the enlightenment. If the people if, if popular sovereignty is going to be the order of the day, that leads you inevitably to a collection of people who call themselves a nation. And popular sovereignty would include the right to make judgments about things like religion and culture and the like. Some judgments we might not find very attractive, but are to be accepted as part of the, uh, as part of the territory. Uh, that's an incomplete answer to a very profound question, but. Gosh, we, we could have an all afternoon seminar, couldn't we? we? Could. This is a, a great they audience. Have to go. They have to go. They have things to do. We would stay all day. Please okay. join me in thanking you. Thank you.